We're certainly blessed to be able to come this evening and the worship is directed by the God of heaven. To do so with brethren and friends, it's always a joy to serve him and we appreciate the fact that you're with us tonight. If you're visiting, we're honored to have you in our assembly. We hope you'll be profited and that you'll come back and be with us real soon. What do you give the man who has everything? Perhaps a better question would be, what is it the man needs? Because even though a man may have everything, that everything may not be something that I would want or that you would want. I want to present a picture to you this evening, first of all, on the slide, on the projection, of a man who has a lot of things. And of the things the man has, I would simply raise this question. Which of those things would you envy that this man has? When you think about him, you think about a man who's in trouble. He has a lot of problems. He has <clears throat> negativity. He has moodiness, disorder, PTSD, tension, depression, despair, stress, agitation, insomnia, awareness, nervousness, temper, worry, frustration, withdrawal, overwhelmed, fatigue, fear, headache, loneliness, negativity, and anxiety. And what else would a man need who had all of that? What about that would you envy? I would suggest to you that we wouldn't want to have any of those problems. There used to be a commercial on television that raised the question, how do you spell relief? And the answer in this commercial was, you spell it R-O-L-A-I-D-S. Well, the man who's pictured in this illustration needs a lot more than Rolades. He's in trouble. The Bible speaks about the difference in care that we ought not to have as opposed to the care that we should have. It talks about care that's wrong and that God does not want his children to have. And so the kind of problems that would create the tension, the anxiety, the worry, the care that's pictured in this illustration is not something that God wants us to experience. On the other hand, the same word care is used in a good sense, in a sense in which God tells us what it is that we need to care for. And I'd like to illustrate this evening and contrast these two different cares and the lesson will be yours. Let's begin our study this evening by talking about the wrong kind of care. And when I talk about the wrong care, I'm talking about the cares of this world. There are some people that get so wrapped up in the concerns and cares of life and of this world that they have no time for spiritual matters. Now, when you turn to the word of God in Luke 8 and verse 14, in the parable of the sword, Luke describes, as also you'll find in Matthew 13 and Mark 4, four different types of soil into which the gospel is put with results that differ. The first kind of soil is the wayside ground, the hard packed down pathways between the plots of ground that were cultivated. And no seed could grow on the wayside ground. The birds came and picked that seed up. The second kind of seed was rocky soil. And that was the kind of soil that was, when the seed was planted, it didn't have any way to shoot roots into the ground because of the rocks, and it soon withered and died. Now the third kind is the kind that I want to em emphasize in our study tonight. Luke 8 and verse 14 says, Now the one that fell among thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares. If you have your Bible, take note of that expression. They're choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life, and bring no fruit to maturity. How many Christians have gone down that road? They obeyed the gospel and they had great joy in what they were doing in becoming a child of God. But over time, the world began to creep in uh, to their thought process and to their lives and to the point that they got further and further away from the spiritual 
and the cares of this world and the pleasures of life and the deceit of riches entered in and choked out the good seed that had been sown. These people are all caught up in the cares of the world. And we ought not to be caught up that way. Again, in the Bible, the re record says in Luke 21 and verse 34, as Luke describes some of the problems that will come to Christians at the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. Now he's warning them several decades in advance, the Lord is, and he says this, but take heed yourself, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the cares of this life, and that day come upon you unexpectedly. So Luke is saying here, the Lord is saying through Luke, you need to be aware of what's coming. You need to be aware that your faith is going to be tested. And as you live your life, you need to realize as a child of God, you need to stay faithful to God. And there are certain things that are going to take your attention and your time away from him. And the spiritual matters that ought to occupy your time are going to be put in the background. And these other things are going to have more weight than they should. And one of these is the cares of life. He lists three things, carousing, drunkenness, and the cares of this life. So if these children of God were not careful, in the about 40 years that would transpire between the Lord saying this and it actually happening in AD 70, there would be a lot of temptation to turn away from the Lord. There would be a lot of temptation to fall away, just as there is in our time, because we can be tempted by drunkenness. We can be tempted by not only that, the cares of this life and the thing can cause us to turn away from the Lord because we have our attention diverted away from spiritual matters. And that kind of thing needs to be alerted to every child of God. It needs to be a warning that we all are aware of that these things can happen. I've known of people who were Christians who turned away and walked no more with Jesus because of the cares of this life. I've known of people who were elders, who were preachers, who turned away and walked no more with Jesus because over time, the cares of this world, the deceit of riches, the things that ordinarily are not wrong per se and in and of themselves, but they become wrong when they divert our attention away from spiritual matters. So we ought not to have the cares of this world. And I might say that when people are overcome with the cares of this world, what's going to result? Anxiety, worry, fear, all of those negative emotions illustrated by the man in the chair who is experiencing them, can be experienced by one who turns away from the Lord. Because when you become concerned about the cares of life more than about spiritual matters, you're going to have your attention diverted away from that spiritual help that can help you and can keep you from falling and can keep you faithful to the Lord. And you just are tempted in ways that you never thought. Those who are wrapped up in the cares of this world are turning away from the Lord. Then again, the future. We ought not to be so blinded by the future and worry about the future that we fail to live in the present. There are some people that want to live in the past and they cannot get over the past. They cannot recognize that life goes on. It may be the death of a loved one. It may be any experience in life that's an unpleasant thing. It may be something that they're trying to overcome, but they can't get over that and they can't get over the future. They don't live in the present. They live in a way that is demoralizing and they're worried about the future. Now the fact of the matter is that we are blind to the future, blind to what's important and blind to God's provision. And the Lord illustrates that in Matthew chapter six and verse 25 in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you'll drink, nor about your body, what you put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? The Lord is saying, don't get so wrapped up in your concern for what you're going to eat and what you're going to put on and, and things of that nature, the physical nature, things that you need, things you have to have, but you can become so absorbed in your desire to have these things that you turn away from serving the Lord. And you're blinded to the fact the Lord realizes you need them. In verse 26 of Matthew 6, he said, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? If you're so concerned about the needs of the life, of this life, that you turn away from putting God first on the front burner and you put him on the back burner, do you not realize that God takes care of the birds? Do you not realize that God cares for those that are least a lot less valuable than you are? You're of more value than they. 
So you're blinded to the things that are really important in life. And then in verse 28 through 30, Jesus said this in the Sermon on the Mount, so why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet, your heaven, that yet even Solomon, all of his glory, was not arrayed like one of them. If God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? Jesus said, you ought not to worry about these things. They ought not to be of main concern in your life. Serving the Lord first should be your first concern. But if you become so absorbed and so distracted by the things and the cares of this life that you turn away from the Lord, you are making a tremendous mistake. You're blind to what's really important. You're blind to the fact that God takes care in his providence of the things in nature, such as the birds and the flowers of the field. He'll clothe you as well. He understands you're a lot more valuable than they are. You think God's going to turn his back away and not provide our needs? When he provides the needs of these lesser creatures in life? Certainly not. Then again, he says it's useless. Look at your Bible again as we look back and note verse 27. He says, which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? What does it accomplish when you worry about the things of the world? When you worry about the future and the bills that you have and other such matters? Now, he's not saying you ought not to give attention to these. Some people have the idea that God's going to take care of me, so I don't need to do anything to take care of myself. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying you ought not to provide for your own needs. The Bible says we need to work, labor with our hands, that which is good that we may have to give to those who need. But he's saying we ought to have that in perspective and realize the most important thing in life is not providing these things. These things that are perishable, these things that will pass away, these things that God knows you need, and God will provide that need. But you need to seek him and his kingdom first. It is useless to serve these things first. It's useless because which of you by th taking thought can add one cubit to his statue? A cubit is 18 inches. How many of us who are short, if you're short, can add one inch to your height? Now you may put on high heels, and that may raise you up five, six inches, whatever, how, how the high hills are. But you take them off, you're just as low down as you were. So the thing is, that's not going to help you. You can't add 18 inches to your height. You can't add any time, as some versions render that, to your lifespan. There's not one thing we can do that's going to prolong our lives beyond what our lives are able to do. So it's useless to worry about these matters. You can't do anything to add to your height. It's irreligious. Look at your Bible at verse 32. For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. God knows that you need clothes. He knows that you need food. He knows that these things are things that you have to have, and he's going to provide them for them. But you've got to put him first. You can't put him on the back burner. You can't put him aside and serve these things first in your life and please him at all. He won't take second place. He wants first place. He wants number one in your life. And if you're not willing to do that, that's the way the people of the world are. The people of the world live in a dog-eat-dog -dog world. They live in a world in which they're trying to get ahead. They live in a world in which if you've got to run over somebody to get what you want, run over them. But that's not the way the Christian is to act. The Christian is not to live that kind of life. The Christian is to live a life of love and faith and obedience to the Lord and not a life of running over others that get in your way. And it's irreligious. It's just like the world lives when you're concerned first about the material things of life. And not only that, but it's incapacitating. Look at verse 34. He says in that verse, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things be added to you. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. We need to recognize that it's useless. It's something that's not going to accomplish the Lord's work and will. It's something that's going to cause us to lose our souls when we get diverted away from spiritual matters and turn to the cares of this world. The cares of this world are not the cares the Christian is concerned about number one. The cares of this world and the future and what's going to happen are not the things that we need to focus on. We need to focus on the here and now and the things that God would have us to do. So that's the wrong kind of care. What we need to understand is there is a cure. And the cure is stated in the word of the Lord as you look and find that you need to cast your cares on God. Cast all your cares on the Lord. 
Look at your Bible at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 25 through 27. Excuse me, go back to 1 Peter 5, 6 and 7 is what I meant to say. Therefore humble yourselves in the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. How many of us really believe that? How many of us believe that the cares and the troubles and the trials that we have in life are things that we can cast on the Lord? How many of us think the Lord really cares about us? Sometimes people have the idea that God doesn't care about me. I prayed once and he didn't answer my prayer and he doesn't care about me. Well, the Bible gives us the illustration the Lord gave in the Sermon on the Mount when he said, Ask and you shall find. Seek and it shall be given to you. Seek, ask, keep on seeking, keep on asking, keep on searching, keep on praying. Don't give up. Put your faith in the Lord that he's going to take care of you. Put your faith in him that he's going to provide those needs. And when, he does, when you cast all your care upon him, he will care for you. The Apostle Paul expresses a similar thought in Philippians 4, 6, and 7 when he had this to say. Be anxious for nothing. Some versions render that. Don't worry about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Notice the three words he uses. Prayer. That is the worship aspect of our approaching God as we speak to him in prayer. And supplication, that is the intense type of praying where we pour our hearts out unto God. Paul said, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel as they might be saved in Romans 10 and verse 1. And prayer is an expression of the heart's desire to God. And he says, I want you by prayer and supplication. And notice what he adds to that, with thanksgiving. How many of us are thankful to God when we go to him with our supplications? When we have an intense type of prayer where we really have a need in our lives, where we're really in trouble in life, and we go to him for relief of that trouble, how many of us take the time to be thankful in that prayer? Paul said, with thanksgiving, there's always something you can be thankful for. I recall a preacher one time who always had a positive attitude, and when he would pray, he would always be thankful and always pray in such a way to express thanksgiving. One day, it was in the wintertime where he was, and it was a part of the country where they have snow and ice, and they had a big snowstorm, and very few people assembled that Lord's Day, and he was leading the prayer. And people wondering, what in the world is he going to say about today? And when he prayed, he said, Lord, we thank you that every day is not like today. And we need to be thankful. You know, we can be thankful for everything. I remember one time when I was in a meeting, and I was riding in the back seat of a car after a service one night, and we were going to one of the elders' houses to eat supper. And I was admiring the car, and I asked the man, I said, what kind of car is this? This is a nice car. He said, it's a Mercedes. I said, a Mercedes? He said, yep. Well, I didn't have a Mercedes. I don't know very many preachers that drive Mercedes. And I began to think to myself, you know, I sure wished I had a Mercedes. I sure wish my old Chevrolet was a Mercedes. And then I got to realize that old Chevrolet I was driving would take me anywhere that Mercedes would go. And I got to thinking, I need to be thankful for what I have. And sometimes we think others have things that we don't have. And so we're jealous of that. We're envious of that when we ought not to be. And we think about that and it doesn't allow us to be thankful for what we do have. And what we do have is an abundance from God. So we need to be thankful. Everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. I remember the day my mother got an automatic washer and dryer. For years, she hung her clothes out every day. As I was growing up as a little boy, she'd hang them on the line, and her and her mother who lived right behind us would wash clothes on Monday, and they would iron all day Tuesday and listen to the soap operas on the radio. And I remember when I was a teenager, she got her first automatic washer and dryer, and I think she was the happiest lady in town. And that certainly was something she needed to be thankful for. But did you ever stop and thank God for all the blessings he's given us? He's given us more than any other people on earth. He's given us things that a lot of people would love to have and don't have. I remember one time going to a, a Walmart, and it was full of people. And you get to the line, and the person who's checking out the items to be checked out as you're standing there in line is taking her time or he, he's taking his time and you think boy I wish you'd hurry up and finally you get to the point where he can check you out and he puts a sign up and said I'm going to lunch you'll have to go somewhere else so you get over another line and it's taking forever to get through that line as well you know how many people there are in the world who would love to be able to go to a Walmart 
or some other such store and spend all day long if need be to get the things that you and I take for granted. And how thankful are we for what we have? How thankful are we for the blessings that God has given us? Going back to Philippians 4, 6, and 7, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasseth all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Jesus will give us that peace of mind that no one else can give. It will guard you. That word guard is a military term. It's like a guard standing, guarding someone. And the peace of God will guard our hearts and our minds. What is there that people want more than that? To have their hearts guarded, their minds guarded. Their minds guarded so they're not worrying all the time. So that they're not anxious all the time. They're not fearful all the time. They're not frustrated all the time. They're not agitated all the time. Why? Because their faith is in the Lord. Because they've turned all their care over to God. Because they know and they believe in their hearts that God cares for us. And they express in prayer their deepest needs to the Father. And turn it over to Him. And trust Him that He's going to take care of us. So we don't have to care about the cares of this world, number one, in our life. We don't have to care about the future. These things are things we ought not to care about, number one. Well, what is the right kind of care? Well, the right kind of care is to take thought for the needs of others. You know, when you turn to the scriptures, you'll find that same word that says we ought not to have in regard to the cares of this world and in regard to the future. The same word is used for the needs of others. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul is talking about the body as an illustration of the fact that we are the body of Christ as the Lord's church. And he talks about the fact that the body has parts that ought to realize the importance they have in the body. And as if, if you turn to 1 Corinthians 12, you'll find where he talks about this in such a way that you and I can appreciate. If you look at your Bible in verse 12, the body is... <coughs> The body has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. He repeats the same thing in verse 14. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. He repeats it in verse 20. But now indeed, there are many members, yet one body. And the physical body has many members. The spiritual body has many members as well. He talks about the fact that... <clears throat> If the foot should say in verse 15, because I'm not the hand, I'm not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? Certainly the foot is a part of the body, just like your hand is. If the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I'm not of the body. Is it not of the body? Certainly it is. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If your whole, whole body was an eye, where would your hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But God has set each member, each one of them, in the body just as it pleased him. And if we're all one member, where would the body be? And then he talks about the fact of not only not putting yourself down. Don't say, well, I can't do what so-and-so does. I can't preach. I can't teach publicly. I can't do this or that. And so I'm no, not important in the body of Christ. There are no vesti vestigial organs in the body of Christ. But he goes on to say, you can't put others down either. He says, as you continue in verse 21, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor give the head to the feet, I have no need of you. And he expresses how that you can't put someone else down because they can't do what you do. Did you ever stop and think about the talents that you have have been given to you by the Lord? And that were it not for the grace of God and the providence of God that you wouldn't be able to do what you do that others might not be able to do. And the fact is, they may be do, able to do things that you can't do. That's because everyone is different. Everyone is important. No one is unimportant. Everyone is necessary in the body of Christ. But dropping down, as you read further in this, in verse 25, that there should be no schism in the body. The Lord doesn't want any division. Suppose you decided you wanted to go somewhere, and your left foot decided you wanted to go that way, and your right foot decided you won't go another way. Well, that's ridiculous. It would never happen. It happens in the body of Christ when brethren don't get along like they should. When there's gossiping and backbiting and things going on that separate body, separate people from one another. That's not what the Lord intended. He intends for all of us to be one in the body of Christ. That there should be no schism in the body, but that the members, now listen to it, should have the same care for one another. If you have your Bible, underscore that. 
The members should have the same care for one another. Not the cares of the world, not the cares about the future, not the cares about what we're going to wear, what we're going to eat or anything like that, but have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all members are rejoice with it. Now you're the body of Christ and members individually. Think about that. We're members of the body of Christ. When someone suffers, we need to suffer as well. When someone prospers, we shouldn't be jealous of that. We should be thankful. We should be honoring them and to realize that when they're honored, we need to realize that honor as well. In Philippians 2, 20 and 21, Paul said this, I have no one like-minded, speaking about Timothy, I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. Timothy had a care. It was not number one, the cares of this world. It was not number two, the cares for the future. His care was for his brothers and sisters in Christ. His care was for the church. And he says, for all seek their own things and not the things which are of Christ. So that what, that's what ought to be the main thought of our study. That ought to be the main thought of our care. How is it that I can serve others? How can I best serve the church? In 2 Corinthians 11 and 28, when Paul spoke about all the things he was suffering and that came upon him daily, he says, besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. Paul, are you concerned? I'm concerned. Are you concerned about your riches and material wealth? I'm not concerned at all about that. Are you concerned about what you're going to eat and what you're going to wear and, and the future and all of those things the world is concerned? I'm not concerned about that. What are you concerned about, Paul? I'm concerned about the well-being of the churches. Now, Paul was an apostle, and his concern was for all the churches. We're not apostles, but I tell you what we need to be concerned about. And that is, how can I best serve the church? How can I best be one who's going to be valuable in the body of Christ? You know, when you think about that, you think about the fact that that's the way that people keep their sanity. Years ago, I saw a man on TV, I don't recall whether it's a psychiatrist or psychologist, but along that line, and he was asked by the interviewer, if you thought you were going crazy, what would you do? And I thought his answer was very perceptive. He said, I'd find someone worse off than I was and I would help them. Now you think about that. Helping someone who's worse off than you. How can I be of service to the church? How can I be of service to my fellow man? How can I be of service to my brother or sister in need? And not just lip service, but doing whatever is necessary to help them in their time of need. That's what the Lord expects of us, to have that kind of care, that kind of concern, and to realize as we live our lives that we're not left to live alone, but we can handle life with God and with our brethren. That's the way God has set us to do His will, to serve Him, to serve others, to face life with Him and with others. Now that's the kind of concern we need to have and not the other. Now, let me illustrate the fact that the kind of care that's the wrong care is the care that paralyzes. When a person is concerned about the world, concerned about their health, concerned about their job, concerned about whatever, and that takes their time and their effort and their energy, that is a fear, that is an anxiety, that is a worry, that is a care that will paralyze you and cause you not to do what the Lord wants you to do. The other kind of care, the right kind of care, the care where I know that God is watching after me, taking care of my needs, while I strive to help others who are in need, where I'm concerned and careful about their needs, that's the kind of care that energizes. That's the kind of care that motivates us to do what the Lord wants us to do. And may the Lord help us to have the proper kind of care. There's a right kind and a wrong kind of care. Now, if you're not a Christian, you're not exercising the right kind of care. You're not showing the proper care for yourself, number one. You need to be a Christian because you have your responsibility to yourself. But you need to be a Christian, number two, because of others who look to you, for example. And if you're not a Christian, the Lord said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. If you're a child of God already and committed sin that needs to be made right, you need to make it right. In a public way, if it's a public sin, in a private way at home, if it's a private sin. But make your life right with the Lord, set your life in order according to God's word and will, and then exercise the right kind of care. While together we stand and sing, we invite you to come.